All right, everyone, welcome. Uh, we're going to get started with an opening prayer that John Tipper is going to offer, and then I'll introduce our speaker, Michael. Yeah. Our Father in heaven, we give thee thanks for this day and for the opportunity to meet together in this lecture. We're grateful for Michael and his preparations for sharing his research and passions with us. And we pray that thou bless him as he does so that he may be able to communicate in a way that is pleasing unto himself. And we thank thee for the opportunity to be here. We're grateful for each of our students and we pray for them in particular at this time as they are finishing up the semester. We pray also for ourselves that we may be able to finish the semester strong as well. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, I'm Mindy Anderson. I'm a member of the Faculty Association Board and I'm the representative for the College of Business and Communication. Uh, where Michael is a member of that. In case you don't know, uh, the Faculty Association Board, we help uh, facilitate communication between faculty and administration, and also between each other as faculty members. And so part of the shared scholarship lecture is a chance for uh, us to be able to share with each other some of the cool things that we've been working on uh, during various things. Uh, Michael is gonna share with us a little bit today uh, some of what he did during his uh, faculty leave uh, just recently. So this is exciting. Um, I'm also excited to introduce Michael. I was actually on his committee when he first got hired here at BYU-Idaho. So I ha I've had a chance to attend several of his classes uh, as he was first getting started and he was excellent then. I'm sure he's even better now with a few more years practice. Uh, but he was hired here at BYU-Idaho in the business management department in 2017. He initially got his uh, law degree from the University of San Diego School of Law in 2009, and he uh, practiced uh, business law at the law firm of Beard St. Clair in Ed Idaho Falls, and then he moved to Orlando, Florida, uh, where he had some interesting cases down there as well, I believe, um, practicing law for a while there as well. Uh, he did start teaching some online writing classes for BYU-Idaho while he was there, and hopefully that helped him fall in love with here, and that's maybe what influenced part of his decision to come here. But we're so glad to have him uh, both in our college and here at the university, and look forward to hearing what you have to share. All right. Um, I'm thankful for this time to be able to talk about uh, some of my research. I'm thankful to be at BYU-Idaho, where I've been able to blend some of my research interests with my classes. Um, primarily, like Mindy said, I teach uh, business law and business writing, um, and I've had a great time doing both of those. Kind of when I think about what I was, what what I hope for, like, like, like what are my goals from this whole experience? Really, one is that I hope that it comes across as interesting. For me, it was. I had to convince Laura that it was too. Laura's <laughs> nice enough to come and she put up with me over the last several years while I was starting this research and then kind of completing it. And uh, and, and so that was great. It's been rewarding for me and I, and I hope that it can maybe inspire others who are looking at uh, down the road at, at projects or research that, that they could do. Um, the other thing that I really hope, and, and I'll talk about this throughout, but I hope that this helps others have an appreciation for our legal system. Um, one of the things that has impressed me is watching kind of the progression of U.S. laws, but that we can see it over time. And and uh, and, and that to me is um, inspiring and gives me faith in the system that we've adopted. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about why that's important. Um, okay, so uh, with that, um, I wanna start by when I teach business law, often I, I, I have to explain to my students that our rights and our freedoms and our responsibilities 
weren't invented yesterday. And, uh, and, and sometimes I feel like I'm up against some myths, starting with perhaps this one. Um, so, uh, <laughs> um, so uh, with that, um, I am going to be tracing one specific area of contract law through the Elizabethan period uh, up until modern times. I could have chosen any many other principles of law, for example, our contract, tort, um, what else? Uh, uh, many areas, uh, criminal law. We can trace these back thousands of years. We could go back to ancient Babylon. I, I just didn't get that ambitious. So uh, we're going to stick to the last 400 years. Um, but uh, in our modern legal education system, uh, and, and I've got a couple of students here, some of whom are interested in going to law school, what you'll find is that when you are introduced a legal principle, you will sometimes be given a tributary hint of, of how we got to where we are. So a, a classic example is uh, when you study property law, the first case that every law student learns about is about a fox and who owns this fox. And basically you've got two competing parties. One started the chase, his hounds were after the fox and another farmer just happened to see the fox running, shot it and took it, got sued for taking the other, the, the, the initial, the, 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 the party that started the chase claiming that that was his property. But it's quick and nobody really cares because all that you're ever tested on, on the bar exam or on law school exams are, what is the law today? So if it is introduced, it's this quick little nugget and then forget about it and move on because if you wanna practice law and make any money, you just need to know what the US current interpretation of property rights is, for example, right now. So um, with that in mind, uh, what I hope to do is not to give just a quick dollop of information regarding uh, this, this contract law principle, but to give it more depth. And to do that, I have to start with Dr. Rodrigo Lopez. Um, this is an interesting character. Um, he was educated in medicine at the University of Coimbra, receiving his doctorate in 1544 in Portugal. Uh, uh, so this is him right here. He moved to London in 1559 after being run out of Portugal during the Inquisitions. Although he was a confessed Christian, he was accused of being a Murano, which uh, is a secret Jew, somebody who professes Christianity, but in secret um, practices the Jewish rites. Um, in London, he became a doctor of notes, uh, attending to many important individuals who eventually connected him up with Queen Elizabeth I, and he became her private, uh, the royal physician. Um, now, um, while it, and, and this is important for later on, while he was the queen's doctor, um, the queen was noted to wear a bezoar stone. Uh, some accounts say that it was in her ring, other accounts say it was in her crown as part of the crown jewels. Uh, and I'm going to come back to that because that's going to that's going to play a role. Uh, Queen Elizabeth um, also this is also important granted him a monopoly over uh, the importation of some medicines, and uh, these include uh, aniseed and sumac. Uh, both of these are native to Asia in 1584. So that's when he got this monopoly to bring in uh, these uh, medicines and spices. Now. Going back a little bit in the 1580s, the Spanish Anglo War had started after the execution of Mary, Queen of Scots, at which point Philip II, the, the King of Spain, swore to uh, invade England, kill Queen Elizabeth, and put a Catholic back onto the throne. As a result, there was a lot of intrigue in the courts. There was concern that there were assassins within, um, within England. Lopez, Dr. Lopez at this time made an enemy of one of the queen's favorite cousins. His name was the Earl, well, the Earl of Wessex. And um, basically, 
So my wife is a, is a nurse. So she'll like this. This is my little joke. He's the first person that I've found to violate HIPAA regulations <laughs> because um, what he did was he disclosed to some Spanish ambassadors about uh, some STDs that he was treating of this Earl of Wessex. Word got out quickly and it, it wasn't difficult to trace back who had unleashed this information. Um, and so this, the Earl of Wessex immediately started plotting against Dr. Lopez. Uh, eventually what happened is they found some uh, notes between Spanish, um, Spanish known spies and some, um, some Portuguese citizens that, that were living in London at the time under torture uh, by the Earl of Wessex, they implicated Dr. Lopez as somebody that was going to poison the queen. And uh, he was arrested um, and tried. I found that Sir Edward Coke, the noted legal scholar of the age was assigned as the prosecutor calling Lopez a perjured murdering villain and a Jewish doctor worse than Judas himself, not a new Christian, but a very Jew. Um, he was locked up for three months. Queen Elizabeth did not sign his death warrant, but uh, after that time, she gave in, signed his death warrant. He was hung, drawn, and quartered. Um, and I'm not going into detail about that because I can't. Laura can deal with blood. I, I can't. So um, he was killed, let's just say. And uh, unlike others convicted and hung for treason at the time, his assets were not confiscated by the queen. Uh, there's some indication that she doubted the validity of, of his um, culpability and assigned to his wife all of his assets, his large estate, and continued from the crown money to pay his son's education. Um, around the same time, so about 1598, Shakespeare was writing The Merchant of Venice, and it's widely assumed uh, that Dr. Lopez was the inspiration for Shylock, the uh, conniving, uh, greedy Jew uh, that is um, depicted in The Merchant of Venice. All right, so with that, um, we need to talk about bees or stones. Uh, and really, I've, I've done more research than I care to admit. And when it comes down to it, what I realize is that I can just rely on J.K. Rowling to explain what a Bezoar stone is. Uh, I was reading this book to my son at the time, and I just thought that this was a made-up thing for a child's book. Uh, not so. Um, as Professor Snape said, a Bezoar is a stone taken from the stomach of a goat, and it will save you from most poisons. This has been a belief through countless civilizations for thousands of years, probably originating in Persia about 4,000 years ago. Um, and again, there, there's a lot more there, but I'll, 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 I'll leave that for you if, if you're interested. Um, but it's important to just understand that uh, Bezoars at the time um, were carried around by individuals. As, you, as I mentioned, Queen Elizabeth had one. Uh, goldsmiths were involved because they were often decorated to be put into jewelry or held on somebody's person. Which brings us to the case uh, that I want to talk about today. Um, the case is titled Lopez versus Chandler. Um, and we don't have images of any of these people, but uh, th these are likely, uh, th th this, this is a good frame of reference. So uh, just so uh, Robert Chandler is going to be the defendant in this case. He is a goldsmith in London. Um, London goldsmiths at the time were almost seen uh, and were seen as bankers. You could uh, deposit um, valuable items with them. They could keep things locked up. They had more insurance, uh, early forms of insurance. These were essentially accountants uh, of the time. Now we've got Geronimo Lopez. Now, what I found so interesting about this is uh, Geronimo Lopez is all, all this is an important case. Let, let, let me start here. Uh, that this case right here has been seen as a fundamental and foundational case establishing an important element of contract law. Uh, I did find one note somewhere that said, um, 
Well, in, in almost all commentaries about the case, it says we know nothing about Geronimo Lopez. He probably came from Portugal and was trying to sell items in London. And that's the extent of it. Um, but uh, as I'll show you later, what I found uh, through my research is that this is the brother of Dr. Lopez. And, uh, and, and, and that things start to fall into place once I made this connection. Um, he was a merchant at the time. Uh, merchants from Portugal were the primary drivers of commerce of the spice trade. So the Dutch East India Company is going to come into existence, but not until 1602. They've got ships going, but primarily a lot of it is, is happening. Trade with India is from originating from Lisbon. Um, now this is extra important because with his brother, now that we know his brother had the, the monopoly of certain spices into England, it seems likely that Geronimo is probably just in the family business. His brother got the monopoly. He's assisting his brother in this trade of important spices that are coming into the country. Robert Chandler, a well-known, and it says established goldsmith in London. Okay, so at this point, I want to take a step back because the number one question that I always get is, what on earth? Like, why did you decide to study medieval and post-medieval cases? Um, and I think there's an interesting story here. During uh, three years ago, uh, we were shut down. I was teaching from home. Laura was at the hospital often, and I was with the kids, and we were trying to come up with fun things to do. So we did, we, we read a lot, we, we spend a lot of time in the mountains, uh, but we, we're not really TV watchers, but we do have YouTube. And I found this show called Time Team. So this is a, a, a British archeology span show and it is fascinating. Um, what they do is every episode, they'll find a new site. They have three days to dig that site and find clues as to what it was, who lived there and, uh, we loved this show. I think we've seen pretty much every episode and it ran for 20 years. It ended about 10 years ago. Um, maybe not, maybe, I'm sure we haven't, but we've seen a lot. And, um, and this was interesting for the kids because they knew that the, our last name, Hales, is an English last name. Well, that was kind of the extent that, that we knew. And so we, we jumped on the family search. We started doing more genealogy. Um, the kids enjoyed this. It was amazing. You don't have to wait till you're 60 to do genealogy. Um, this, uh, this home here was the, the ancient seat of the Hales family going back 700 years. And so um, all of this caught their attention. And, and all of a sudden, we were kind of history people, something that we never saw happening beforehand. Um, and then following that summer into the fall, we had um, a great deal, as you recall, of civil unrest in the United States that then spread uh, elsewhere. Um, now, throughout the civil unrest, uh, what, uh, what concerned me the most is that I started seeing um, not just academics, but people on the street um, and even lawyers. So a couple of lawyers famously were arrested for throwing Molotov cocktails um, and others were uh, claiming uh, that the U.S. legal system was rotten to its core, uh, summarizing a, a number of the, the arguments that were made at this time. Uh, this was uh, later substantiated by a number of surveys here from the Pew Research. Uh, this first one is the percent of people that say, the, the, the question really was, does racism come down to systematic or individual racism? So over here, you've got um, people that claim or feel that racism is baked into the laws. And, and, and what was concerning is that in the whole US population, nearly a quarter of people said that racism is baked into the laws itself. Um, at the same time, you've got this decrease in the most visible element of the US legal system is the Supreme Court. And, and as you can see, you've got a noted decline in confidence that the Supreme Court will deal justly. Um, so uh, that concerns me because one, 
I, I don't feel that that's the case, that, that, that the reason that I went into law in the, in the beginning, really, I, and I get this question a lot, like, why did you become a lawyer? I can trace it back to a lot of things. One was being falsely accused by my fourth grade teacher of throwing something that Tony did. But, but the other part was, I just wanted to do good within the framework that I saw as a just legal system and promoting justice through that system was, in my opinion, and remains to this day, a noble goal. Um, my kids did find this interesting that there's that, that there is a precedent of uh, of revolts, of protests, of riots leading to changes in the law. And one of the most pronounced of these was the peasants' revolt. So now we're jumping back even further, right? But th there's a point to this one. Um, the Peasants' Revolt uh, started in uh, Kent, so in the southeast of England, where the Hales are from. And led by Watt Tyler, they were protesting taxes, unsurprisingly. Um, taxes were to the point that uh, the, the poll tax required the same amount of tax from any individual, whether you were wealthy or a peasant. So obviously this hurt the peasants much more. Uh, they grabbed their farm equipment, marched to London, uh, whereupon uh, really the center of their ire was on John Gaunt, who was raising these taxes, but he was gone. He, he had fled, but the king was still there. So the young king, Richard II, who is about 11, 12, 13 at this time, is holed up in the Tower of London. Now with him are two individuals. One is the, the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, Sudbury, and uh, the chief tax collector who just happened to be named Robert Hales. Uh, so this is one of my ancestors. Um, as the chief tax collector, he's not the most popular man in England at the time. Uh, both of these men are beheaded, uh, their heads put on spikes on the Tower of London, um, but, which is terrible. But well, there was some positive part to this story. And, and, and what's interesting is that the peasants were marching, uh, wanting the rights of Magna Carta. Now, the first stop that I made on my uh, FLF sabbatical trip here to London was to the British Library, where they've got uh, about three copies of the Magna Carta set out. Um, now, the, the Magna Carta was signed by King John in 1215. Um, but really, this was this was a, a, a bill of rights for the wealthy, for the barons at the time. They wanted, um, they, they made a number of demands, chief among them. Um, let's see here. Um, no new taxes unless the barons agree. So this is the start of parliament. Uh, that no man would be imprisoned except by lawful judgment of his equals. So this was the early jury. Um, a statement that the monarch does not have absolute power and that they can own and inherit property. Well, the peasants of 1381 basically said, if it's good enough for you, it's good enough for us. And they had some radical demands at the time. And yes, the, the peasants' revolt was squashed. Um, many of their leaders were killed. But the seeds were already planted. And, and that led to... Uh, a great deal of economic development, uh, moving slowly away from the feudal system um, and allowing this, uh, well, basically merchants uh, to, to set up their wares instead of being governed strictly by the monopolies of the guild. And this is the guild hall today still existing in London. Uh, you had what they called liberties where you could transact business um, outside the jurisdiction of the crown. Uh, the most famous of this, of these being Borough Market, if you've been south of the river uh, in London, uh, where people would go, they could sell whatever they want, bags, merchandise, uh, and, and all of a sudden you've got peasants that are making money, purchasing land, and the whole economic system starts to change. So that all interested me, and that's how I began my research. Uh, what's What I found is, I started with this case of Lopez versus Chandler. It looked interesting and, and I couldn't find any 
uh, transcriptions of the case itself. Everything that's written about it is a summary. So I wanted to find the case. So I went to the, the before I left on my trip to London, I searched the National Archives had a very difficult time doing this. Uh, fortunately, I've got a daughter who's a little bit more savvy and uh, she ended up actually finding the specific case of Chandler versus Lopez uh, that I wanted, um, which was incredible. I, 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 what's interesting about the archives is they've got, um, just to kind of show you how this, oh, here it is. Um, how it's set up, they've got millions and millions of documents. Uh, none of them, well, I'd say 95% of them are not digitized. So you can't just look it up online. Uh, you have to go there. Uh, so I, I, I put in about 30 document requests, all different cases that I was interested in. And the first one that I got to was this. And uh, now I don't read Piddle English or... This 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 early English uh, written in the 1500s. This is a, a 1500 case, but I could read that, and uh, and as soon as I got it, and just to be clear, I didn't write on the document. So this is this is me taking a picture, just in case anybody in the archives ever sees this. Uh, I took the document, and I took a picture of it, and I used my marking tool, and I sent this to Lara because this was my hallelujah moment um, after searching. And even when they bring you the documents, they bring you a stack of hundreds of these things and you just have to go through them until you find the document that you want. But this was it. And my heart jumped. Uh, I had found it. I had found the actual lead, legal pleadings of Geronimo Lopez. This is the entire document right here. Um, and uh, this, is a, this is the first page. Um, now, lest you think I spent my entire week... Um, just reading these documents, which actually was the plan. Uh, I got really lucky to run into uh, some new friends, uh, the Smiths, if I can do this. Um, and here's another here's another tidbit. So I, um, while I was in London, I, I went to church on Sunday at the Kensington Ward. And as I was going in, the first word was coming out and uh, this is a former student from three years ago. So this is Isaac Smith. And he runs up and he says, Brother Hales. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, we got chatting. He was there with his family. And uh, I'm really happy that his mom, Shelly, is here. So thank you for coming. Um, because they kind of adopted me. So as I would spend all day in the archives, they would take me to dinner. Because my plan really was just to eat cliff bars and keep reading the documents and to the middle of the night. But they made sure that I was well fed for which Lara was very thankful. And I guess the lesson here is be nice to your students because they might invite you places. <laughs> they randomly run into you in foreign countries. Um, and and that, was, that, that was a great part of the trip as well. Um, I didn't stay at the London, uh, the National Ar Archives the entire time. Uh, this is a picture of the Canterbury Archives. I found a number of cases there that uh, were interesting to the Hales family and and uh, and and property and uh, disputes. I actually found, I wanted to focus on this one. Um, my side of the Hales family, uh, because of the laws of primogeniture, we, we, we lost our riches, right? Like we, we, we became poor. I, I, I don't come from a line of just male heirs, right? Like I got, I was a third son. So, so, so we, we, we became, uh, my sixth grade grandpa was a, a shoe repairman, a cobbler. Um, but about that very same time, the Hales that had retained their lands and property were putting up this sign, which I just think is horrible um, because this is uh, Hales Place in Canterbury. The gardens and pleasure grounds of Hales Place have been much injured by persons breaking down the young trees and shrubs and doing other damage therein. Notice is here, hereby given that if any person shall be found trespassing, they will be persecuted with the utmost rigor of the law and steal traps. They put bear traps throughout the property to cut their feet. Uh, this, 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 was, this was pretty bad. Um, this document was just about, about this big. I imagine it was kind of put up throughout Canterbury. Uh, same with this. I, I, I really enjoy the second piece because it's one of the first written or, or uh, marked out uh, 
what do we call that coat of arms for that for the Hales family um, that that I've been able to find. So I I thought that was interesting. And one of my ancestors was Edward Hales, who was a a barrister is what that means. He was an attorney. Um, so great. I've got hundreds of pictures and copies of cases um, that, that I would like to transcribe, but I'm having great difficulty actually doing the, the, the transcription. So this is where, um, let's see, Jack, Jack, are you here? Jack's not here. Um, but I had a student last semester who I told about this and he got extremely interested and wanted to help with the trans transcription process. So um, he jumped in last semester and he uh, he was having the same difficulty that I was, but he was like, you know what, there's gotta be a better tool. So we found this AI assisted tool called Transcribus uh, that, that you can uh, access here. Basically all you have to do is upload any document. It will go through it. It will assess what time period it is in and it will spit out a very rough translation of, of what's going on in that document. Um, but that was a great help because he got through uh, these initial um, Chandler versus Lopez cases. What did we find? Well, um, a couple things. Um, the case itself the, the, the case facts I find incredibly interesting. In, in essence, what Lopez does is he comes to London and he wants to buy a Bezor. Uh, in the complaint, he says that he goes to Chandler because he, is, he has a high reputation and is known and, and has skill and knowledge unique about Bezors. So he says to Chandler, I'd like to buy a Bezor. Chandler gives him a stone that is purported to be a Bezor. Lopez trades him. So instead of giving him, it was a hundred pounds, which today's money would be about a hundred thousand um, dollars. But instead of giving him a hundred pounds, he trades. So he's got this transaction where Lopez gives to Chandler as part of this trade, a diamond ring and 10 pounds. Lopez takes the ring uh, shows it to other jewelers who tells him that this is a fake stone, that this is not a legitimate or a true, as he calls it, a true bezoar. So he sues for fraud. The complaint itself um, says that he's suing for deceit. That, that was the terminology used at the time for what we would call fraud. This is just an interesting tidbit that nobody, I, I don't think, had ever found in the document itself, Chandler of the city of Bristol. So he's transacting in London, but it appears that he's from Bristol. I just thought that was interesting that, that they added that. And then it gets really interesting. Um, so the complaint itself, and I've kind of walked through this so you can follow along slightly here. Um, he says that he only hopeth that the said Chandler being called to answer will come to court and that he will confess the truth of what he promised in essence, he's asking, please convey to me, please give me a real Bezor stone. You can keep the diamond, but I want a Bezor stone. And, and this really caught my eye right here because he says, basically he's asking for the queen's subpoena of Chandler. Basically he's saying, please subpoena him, bring, it, bring him into court and make him testify under oath. Um, he does that. But this is the part that uh, that I alluded to earlier. In Chandler's answer, Chan, Chandler's, as he's spelling was different back then. I, I really, that with no spell checker, they spell everything different every time. But um, Chandler does answer, and through his attorney says uh, he just adds this tidbit that 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 is nowhere else but in the pleadings that, like I said, haven't been transcribed. He, he's talking about Geronimo Lopez, and he says, he being the reputed brother to Lopez, the physician recently executed. And Dr. Lopez had been executed about four years prior to this. But it's interesting that it's thrown into the actual pleadings there. All right, so there's the case. Lopez eventually loses this case. The judges argue about this at great length. 
because they're split. The, the, the judges, and it's appealed over multiple years. It starts in 1598, and it's not decided until 1606. And the judges fall back on a rule of caveat emptor. So this is the legal principle of buyer beware. If you're going to buy something, then it's incumbent on you to make sure that the thing that you're buying is the thing that you want to buy. Um, and, and this was reiterated uh, in the United States in 1827, here with this quote from James Kent saying that the common law affords every reasonable protection against fraud, but it doesn't go to the romantic length of giving indemnity against the consequences of indolence and folly or careless indifference to the ordinary and accessible means of information. If you're going to buy something, do your homework is the, I'd say, the modern way of, of saying this principle. Now, in 1804, so slightly before that, the, the case that solidified Lopez versus Chandler in U.S. law was uh, a case where uh, one of the parties, his last name was Wood, which is perfect because it's about Wood, um, but he bought what he thought was Rosaletto wood, um, but it ended up being a different kind of wood. And he sued for fraud, apparently because Peachum wood is not as valuable as the wood that he wanted. And the court says that he loses. Once again, if you're going to buy a type of wood, you should check when you purchase it to make sure that it is the type of wood that you're in fact looking for. But as I promised at the beginning of this lecture, what what I've seen and what I've observed is that there's been an eroding away of this principle. And in its place, additional consumer protections placed on the side of what have primarily been the plaintiffs in these cases, claiming that they didn't get what it is that they wanted. And so we move ahead to 1872 in Hawkins versus Pemberton, where a defendant sold a bottle of what, it, what was claimed to be pure blue vitriol. I had to look that up because I had no idea what it is. It's a blue salt of some kind. Um, but what he got was a diluted version of what he had purchased. And the court here whole, actually holds for the plaintiff, the main rationale being he's not an expert on this kind of product. And, and the average reasonable person wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the various qualities of a chemical. That, that falls outside their area of, of expertise. And so we get that. So now I was thinking like, what are, what are the modern, modern Bezoars? Like, like what, what are we out there buying? And um, I noticed that Gwyneth Paltrow's in the news this week quite a bit. Um, and thankfully my, my colleague Adam Bear tipped me off to this on her, what is it called? Gloop? Goop? her website where she sells a very expensive products. One of them is a psychic vampire repellent, a protection mist uh, that is supposed to protect you from psychological vampires that are going to steal your energy. All right. Okay. Uh, now I have, to be honest, I have lots to choose from. We've got healing crystals and oils and all of these things that kind of fit into this realm of what on earth are you buying? Um, fascinatingly, and, and this is what's really interesting, the judges involved in the original Lopez case never said, these or stones don't work, you idiot. That was never part of the argument. It never came into play, even though at the time there were scientific um, experiments going on. Famously, the, 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 the king of France uh, believed firmly in Bezoars. And his chief scientific officer, I, I don't know what the exact title was, said, I don't, I don't think those actually work. That's just a, that's just a rock. <laughs> and, uh, and so they did an experiment. The cook was um, condemned to die for treason. And so they asked the cook, like, would you like to be hung? Or would, would, it, would you prefer that we administer to you poison and give you a bezoar? And he took the bezoar hoping and praying that it actually worked. It didn't. It said he died after seven hours of agony. Um, so, uh, but that never comes. And, and this is what I find extremely important. The, the, the judges in the 1600s, I mean, you've got um, 
Francis Bacon, and all of these thought leaders leading towards the Enlightenment as part of the legal system at the time. But they just put that aside. The question is, is it an actual bees or was it a stone pulled from the, from a stomach of a goat or is it a rock that Chandler just grabbed off the street and sold for a hundred pounds? Um, we see that today. This is, it, it, if you sued Gwyneth Paltrow, Paltrow, which I don't recommend, it, it doesn't seem to be going well from what I understand now, but, um, but if you did and say that it didn't, like like the the psychic vampire still stole your cosmic energy that's not going anywhere um now what you could say is that what was sold to you was some other liquid perhaps um and and that's essentially what when we get down to the main issues of chandler versus lopez or what consumer protections are allotted to you it's it's largely did you receive the thing that you thought you were buying um and that's where the laws protect consumers more, where the average consumer doesn't have a reasonable understanding of what is going on. Investments is a classic example of this. We've got FTX in the news right now. And what we see is the government trying to protect consumers who may be misled by others to purchase a product, the complexity of which they simply don't understand. Uh, NFT student loans is a great example of this as well. The, the you've got one side saying that the individuals didn't know what it was that they were getting into when they signed large student loan loan documents. The other side is saying that's different than investments. Like a, a loan document says, this is what you owe us. We need to hold people to their commitments. And, and, and so that's a great, I think, corollary and argument that's going on right now. Um, my experience, like Mindy, uh, where did Mindy go? Mindy said, I, I spent a great deal of time uh, in Florida as an attorney. And what I found is that um, there were a lot of people trying to get out of timeshares. And timeshares, it's just not something that I knew anything about when I got to, uh, to Florida. But it became, in the end, one of my primary emphases of my legal practice uh, was reviewing timeshare contracts. Uh, any of you that have been to a timeshare sales pitch understand this. Um, they'll get you in by promising whatever, Disney tickets, uh, a free dinner, golf, um, and then they won't let you leave. They'll keep you in there. And, and uh, they've, they've created a system built through top psychologists to make you purchase something um, which is where I get this great uh, meme from here. Um, at the end of the day, usually people are so tired after six hours of just brow beating, they'll sign anything at that point. And they have you sign a lot. You'll go through documents about that thick. Now, what the law did is the law in Florida and other states have adopted this. And they, they said, we've got indications that there is fraud going on. It's like, no duh, but okay. Um, and how do we know this? Well, we know this because the average purchase price of a timeshare right now is about $30,000. Now, if you ever want to resell that, give that away, get rid of your timeshare, uh, the average price of a resale timeshare is somewhere floating around $1 to maybe a couple hundred dollars for some of the more coveted weeks. Um, and so it, it creates this interesting idea of like, where's the balance there? Florida has tried to balance the interests of, of the timeshare companies with the timeshare consumers by saying that every consumer has 10 days to rescind that contract. That's unique. Uh, that, that doesn't come up very often. As, as my students know, a contract typically just offer acceptance, boom, you've got a contract, you're done. It's enforceable. But because of the proclivity of timeshare salespeople to lie. I'm just going to say, um, <laughs> we're going to give you 10 days to get out of that. And so that's, that's, that's one thing, one way that we've seen caveat emptor eroded to some extent in favor of consumers. All right. So um, at the end of the day, what have I gotten out of this? Well, Primarily, I just think 
it's interesting. Uh, I love seeing the, 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 this progression, the changing, the adapting to different economic models and, and different time periods. Uh, to me, I love that. Um, uh, also, and, and I could have made this all about genealogy. We've, we, we've done so much genealogy work through the legal system that I actually think I should, I should teach it. Like, what, what is that roots tech or something like, like how to learn your family history through their lawsuits. Right? Like that, that will get you, that will get you more information than any pedigree chart. Like it was amazing what my family and the divorces and, and, um, and, 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 uh, and, and mostly just, I've got one ancestor that shot a bear in Canterbury. And I didn't even know they had bears, but, but he shot a bear and it fell into the water system and plugged up the water system for Canterbury because it got kind of lodged in the in one of the pipes. And then he gets sued by the entire city for shooting a bear. It's like, like, like that's the part of family history that 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 got that got me interested. It's like, bring on the lawsuits. That's that's great. Um so so that's 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 the other thing. And finally, it's just the the gratitude, the appreciation for centuries of people who have tried to do the right thing, may not have gotten to the right result, but a legal system that at its best is impartial and will weigh the evidence of both sides and make a decision. Lopez, I'm sure, was disheartened by the outcome of his case. But if he brought that case today, it would be a very different circumstance. And it's likely that because Chandler indicated this is a Bezor and he reasonably relied upon those statements, he would win today. And, and any injustice uh, that, that, that may have, have happened throughout history, my goal is that as a society that we appreciate those times, recognize them, identify them, but work towards what we as a society determine to be a just system. Um, doing this uh, has, I believe, helped me uh, in my own class teaching uh, contracts, corporations. My students are interested in this. Uh, I've got Corbin here on the front row is asked to help with the same transcription process and 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 others are are lining up. They 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 just find it interesting. And and that to me is heartening to to see that hope uh, and interest in a legal system that otherwise might seem boring. So uh, with that, I would just encourage you to uh, find those uh, those areas that interest you and go for it. Because for me, this has been a rewarding FLF that, um, because I broke it up over two semesters, unfortunately ends next week, but, <laughs> but has been something that has brought me a great deal of joy. And, um, I, I leave these things with you. I hope that it's been uh, helpful and uplifting. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. amen. amen.